Hi, everyone, and welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Today, we are taking a trip to Provence, um, where we will be tasting three wines from Chateau d'Esclan, who produce some of the most prestigious rosé in the world, including the one and only Whispering Angel. Not only that, we will have the added treat of chatting with Katie Lee Beagle, and she'll be giving us some awesome little recipes that we'll be um, pairing with each wine. So if you purchase this trio ahead of time from wine.com, wonderful. Please go ahead, get these wines open, get them into some glassware. It's gonna be really fun to taste them all side by side. I promise you will still really enjoy this discussion. Even if you don't have the wines, it will just make you more tempted to go out and buy them from wine.com. And of course, this video, as all our videos do, live on on the wine.com YouTube channel. So these are the three wines we are tasting in order from Chateau Desclans, all three rosé. We have the Whispering Angel, the Rock Angel, and the Garus. So it's going to be a delicious tasting. Um, so let's introduce our guests. Coming to us um, from France, we have winemaker Bertrand Lyon. We also have vice president of global marketing, Paul Chevalier. And of course, we have chef and bestselling author, Kaylee Beagle. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, Bertrand. Thank you for staying up late and joining us. <laughs> um, really excited to taste these wines. Um, and, and go through those pairings that you have, Katie. It's gonna be great. Um, so, oh, those of you joining us from home, I wanna let you know, we're gonna do a little storytelling ahead of time. So please feel free to go ahead and start sipping on your rosé while we do. Um, so Paul, I wanna start with you um, in your beautiful pink wall. And- um, Bonsoir. Bonsoir, first of all, yes, bonsoir. Um, merci beaucoup um, for joining us. Um, so let's let's start at the beginning. Give us just a little bit of that history behind Chateau de Sclan, um before 2006. Okay. Well, you know, in, in Provence, uh, rosé is not new. We've been making rosé, producing rosé for, for actually over 2,000 years. So um, it's interesting. And, and in the valley where we're located, and if you think about, uh, think about Provence, the, the current vineyards really stretch from uh, just outside of Cannes all the way to the north uh, around the city of Aix-en-Provence. And we're in this um, valley called the Valley of Esclon. Originally was um, all owned uh, back in the Middle Ages by the Lord of Esclon called Gérard de Villeneuve. And originally there was sort of a, uh, a medieval castle. Uh, remember France, uh, France back th in those days was a, was a little rough and, and the, you know, people were invading and so forth. And we were actually quite high up. I call it the highlands uh, in, in what we call the VAR, which has, is our department. And we have a, actually, there's still remaining a, a um, kind of like a lookout tower. And you can actually see from our property all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. So if someone was coming to invade, they could see that. And, and, and this chateau, which you see today, uh, was built in the sort of 1800s, but the original cellars go back to the 1200s when this castle was there. So it's a fantastic uh, location. Um, it's sort of picturesque with these vineyards which stretch throughout the valley. And I think this yeah. is what makes it quite special. It, it does, and I've had the privilege of, of being there. It was a while ago, but it was just stunning property, stunning place, so much history, so picturesque, if you will. Um, so definitely worth a visit. But talk to us about 2006, um, or when Sasha um, Lachine, who is a wine luminary, um, wanted, he decided to purchase this, this property. What was his vision? So as the story goes, and you know, Sasha had known because he was living in Bordeaux. He came from uh, uh, a Bordelais family, uh, uh, we would say. His father was Alexis Lachine, quite famous. Uh, actually, back in the 19 sort of uh, 60s and 70s and, and 80s, he was uh, a leader in sort of um, teaching actually Americans, uh, about French wines and wines. He had written several books. I, I described him sort of a, he's sort of the French version of, of Robert Mondavi. He's fantastic. And Sasha grew up with that. And, you know, Sasha was in Bordeaux and, and you know, for some reason, you know, in Bordeaux, it's, it's you sort of have to kind of fit in and there's this sort of a, a it's 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 very structured. And Sasha is such an open-minded thinker. He said, I want to do something different. And he said, I'm moving to Provence to make the greatest rosé in the world. And everybody said, hmm, you a little crazy? That's kind of an unusual idea because, you know, Bordeaux and Burgundy and Champagne were, were very, very prestigious. And Provence was not such as prestigious at the time. But he had this vision of making the greatest rosé in the world. 
it's a, it's a lofty goal, but um, one that I think he has done quite well with them. So with him, he brought Patrick Leon, who is also well known, um, studied under his father, Alexis, uh, known for Mouton Rothschild and Opus One and making some of the finest red wine in the world. How on earth did he convince him to go to Provence to make the best rosé in the world? I think I think Patrick was was um, perhaps up for a challenge to to begin with, but uh, and they had this group fantastic relationship uh, throughout all the life of Patrick. And for me, Patrick was number one. He was one of the first French flying winemakers. He had traveled all around the world, very open minded. But number two, he had this this fantastic palate, uh, very precise in the way he would taste and, and and make wine. And the whole challenge of this was. How do you take uh, our local grapes, which we'll talk about, sort of essentially Grenache and Roll, and do different things, innovation within Provence to create a new style of rosé, which really never existed before. And that was the, the genie, as we say in French, so the, the, of, of Patrick Léon was, was taking all the techniques that he had learned around the world, some from Bordeaux, some from Burgundy, some from California and so forth, Mixing that all together and and creating this new procedure, uh, which Bertrand has 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 now taken over, and Bertrand, of course, has been working with us pretty much from the beginning, to create um, many many expressions of what rosé not only can be but could be. So the vision was actually futuristic, and I said everybody sort of looked at us with. Uh, what's going on what's going on and now we know 16 years well we just we're, we'll be bottling the 16th vintage very soon but 16 years later now we know the magic of 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 sasha's vision and and patrick's sort of winemaking skills and mm -hmm. uh, i guarantee the story will be, will be told for many years to come many years and now bertrand's winemaking skills yes. which have come over so um and we'll we'll get to you in a moment bertrand but um katie um so, you know, we are going to be pairing three um, of your recipes from your new cookbook, It's Not Complicated, which is like written for me, I think, because <laughs> like it's not complicated. I'm like, yes, yes, that's what I need. Um, I love delicious, but not complicated. So we're going to be taking three of your recipes and pairing them with these three wines. But I know you are a lover of rosé, a friend of the brand. So when did you first start drinking Whispering Angel? every day. <laughs> oh gosh, I've been drinking Whispering Angel for a really long time. I couldn't even tell you, I can't even remember not drinking it. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> and one of the things that I love so much about Whispering Angel and, and the other two wines that we're having this evening is that it, it's just kind of one of those wines that you can go to and know that it's always going to be good. It's always consistent and it is easy to pair. And I think so often now rosé has become just this kind of, um, it's almost like a verb now, that, you know, that you're, or rosé all day. That, that mm -hmm. kind of, but rosé is a great wine to pair with food. It, it's not just to casually drink. I mean, of course, that's fun too at a party, but you really can pair it with food. It's nuanced and it brings out the flavors um, in both the wine and in what we're going to eat. Um, and I, you know, I think it's perfect for holiday time. We're coming yeah. up on Thanksgiving this week. It's a great Thanksgiving wine. And it's also a great holiday wine as we go into December and into New Year. It, it's really one of those wines you can have any time of day as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that because you've got the rosé and it's got kind of a little bit of the white, a little bit of the red, those different aspects of both those. So when you're looking for something in the middle, which just about everything at Thanksgiving is, right? Um, you know, the rosé is, is the way to go. So I love that. I can't wait to talk about um, those pairings that you have. So Bertrand, I, I want to dive into kind of what makes um, Whispering Angel and Chateau de Slam so unique. Um, I mean, we're in Provence, it's where so much rosé is made, but tell us a little bit about the great varieties you use um, in blending for Chateau de Slam and uh, what they each bring to the blend. Yes, uh, in, in Chateau de Slan, uh, we, we, we use mainly in the blend uh, Grenache as variety, and um, the Grenache is the backbone of our wine. And uh, it, is, it is a wonderful variety uh, because it gives uh, minerality, freshness, and uh, it is also very aromatic. 
So it, it, it's, uh, it's the, the reason why we uh, planted a lot of Grenache since uh, my father and Sasha uh, brought back the estate in 2006. So uh, for Whispering Angel, we have uh, on, on the last vintage, 20, we have more than uh, 50% in the blend. Mm -hmm. And after we have also uh, Senso, 24%. And so it's a different uh, variety. I prefer Gonesh and Senso. Senso gives a more um, fatness, but it's less aromatic. Mm -hmm. Just interesting, but on, on some vintages, it could be very interesting. Okay. And after we, okay. have, we have also Roll. Roll, it's, it's a wide variety, but very, very important in the blend. It's, yeah. it's different. Yeah. More, more subtle, but very interesting. Yes, and and yes. roll is the is the equivalent of vermentino, right, from Italy. Yes. And yes. so, if you've never heard of roll, it's because you most often find it in Italy as vermentino, but it has a richness to it, also, like you said about and so, and you don't find it in every rosé. Uh, I think it's a unique part for for the wine. So we'll talk yes. about. Wine, yeah, and, and yes. How so, yes, so it, it's a uh, Whispering Angel is a unique rose because uh, since the beginning, uh, we wanted to, to make a rose very different. You know, a lot of rose in Provence are very aromatic, but mm -hmm. you, you, you don't have a, a, a mousse very, very long, very rich, and at the, oppo at the opposite. We wanted to make uh, a rosé like a true wine, so with lens, with density, but also with freshness and, and, and crispy. It's, it's not easy to have this balance. I think yeah. we we are on the good way. I would agree. So it's a very, very much fruit forward and, and lovely mouthfeel, which is, uh, yeah. I know, I've hardly met anyone who doesn't enjoy Whispering Angel, sort of crosses all generations. Uh, it does. It's kind of like that universal universal um, um, wine. But the name, Whispering Angel, I love this story because like I said, I was, had a chance to visit. So Paul, can you give us a little bit of the background on the, the name Whispering Angel? No, of course, of course. So, so um, it, I, I've often been asked the question. So at Chateau d'Esclon, um, we have a chapel, which is not unusual for a lot of chateaus in France have a, a chapel. And above the chapel, I mean, sorry, inside the chapel, above the altar, were these faces of the sort of cherubs. And, you know, actually it was um, Zash Lachine and Patrick were sort of looking at that. And, and it sort of looks like one angel is sort of like, or cherub, I guess, is sort of whispering into the ear of the other. They're sort of, the head is down. And they said, oh, that would be a great sort of name for the wine. But the challenge is in, in French, uh, Ange probably could have worked. Uh, there are lots of sort of angel wines. And then, but whispering in French is chuchot. So <laughs> les anges qui chuchot didn't sound very good. So it ended up being the English version being whispering angel. And that's so the story goes. And, and uh, something magical about this name and the, uh, I don't know, there's sort of this, people are in love with, with this uh, whispering angel. It's just something uh, I've hardly seen throughout uh, all of my career in the wine industry. And I think that is the uh, part of it, other than obviously it tastes fantastic. Well, it does taste fantastic. So, and tasting the wine, and Bertrand just mentioned that that blend, the Grenache, the Ciso, and then the roll, which is, you know, for me, I kind of look at like, like that must be the magic ingredient. But um, maybe as you talk us through a, a tasting with this, as we taste it, kind of tell us the aromas, flavors, texture, and just why you think it's so appealing to everyone. <laughs> Sure, Bertrand, why don't you lead in? Uh, yeah. Bertrand has a, has a really good nose. Of course he does. <laughs> yes, well, he makes magnificent wine. Yeah. Yes. And, uh... So for, for the Whispering Angel 20, the nose is very, very fresh and uh, very vibrant because uh, 20, it was uh, one year ago and... Uh, uh, I'm very happy to see that the wine is uh, is able to age, not for not for uh, uh, many years, but after one year is in good shape, very fresh, very uh, it's a it's a, um, 
there is a uh, side citrus. Yeah, uh, citrus and, and, and that ripeness in it, which is, which is lovely. Oh. And this yeah. is all stainless steel, right? Um, for fermentation? Yes. Okay. Yes, the, the, the fermentation is made only in uh, stainless steel tanks to keep the freshness and, uh, and preserve the aromas. And it's, a, it's the traditional way to make uh, classical rosé. And I think I think what's important with Whispering Angel uh, uh, is is all actually with with all these wines is is they're 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 dry, which is literally uh, very close to zero sugar, residual sugar. And so in your mouth you have this sensation of this richness. And I always describe when you when you sip Whispering Angel, it sort of goes like this. <laughs> it's smooth as it goes down. And the problem is it's so smooth before you know it, you drink the whole glass, and that's that's the secret of Whispering Angel. Oh, wow. Oh, your whole glass. Uh, I thought you were going to say whole bottle. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> it is. It's one of those those wonderfully delicious wines. But it, it is. I think it's all about that balance of the fruit, the texture, the freshness, um, the acidity. It's so wonderfully bright. It's perfect. Um, and Katie, we have a pumpkin hummus to go with this, which I just love that idea. Um, to pair with this rosé, can you tell us a little bit, kind of, about this dish? Sure. Yeah. So I really like um, a, a very acidic wine like this. This is what I gravitate towards. And especially when it's holiday time and you're having so much heavy food, it's really nice to have a wine like this that just cuts right through it. It cuts right to the point is what I like to say. So I've got a pumpkin hummus. Um, this is great for uh, coming up this week with with Thanksgiving, you know, I think when you're cooking Thanksgiving dinner and you've got this huge meal to come, keep the hors d'oeuvres light so that everybody is still really hungry when it's, it's wow. time for food to come out. So the pumpkin hummus is a good one. So it's um, a, the traditional hummus recipe with chickpeas, tahini, lemon, but I add pumpkin puree to it. I've got some tortilla chips here to go with it. So a nice salty moment. And then I like to do a garnish of some pomegranate seeds for color. And I think that these really pop as well with the wine. And then I do a little pumpkin seeds on top so that it just looks really pretty. You can do this totally in advance, make it tomorrow and then have it on Thursday. And this pairs so nicely with the wine because it is really creamy and velvety and, and on the richer side. And then you have this nice, bright, acidic rosé to go with it and have the salty chips and it just kind of all marries together and works really well. And it's a really simple recipe. And like Paul was saying, this is so easy to drink. You find yourself just keep going. You know, when you were saying that you feel it go like this. Yep. Like, I feel like my whole mouth pucker in it. I'm ready then to eat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it's getting, you're it's, salivating. You're salivating, but it, right? But it, it's, it's very true because there is this sort of little bit of, I don't want to say oily, but this sort of characteristic that um, does um, make you sort of salivate. I love the idea of salty chips. And it just, it's just this, it, it's, it's almost like it starts like a white wine, but finishes a little bit like a red wine. It's chilled. Mm -hmm. Um, but no bitter, no astringency, and very, very smooth. So, um, I mean, I, th I think it's great, obviously. Mm. I love it. I, I think this is, like you said, such an easy drinking wine and so great during cocktail hour because it does, it makes you want to eat. Yeah, that's perfect. So, well, thank you. I love that recipe idea. That will probably be on my table during the holidays. So our next wine that we are doing is uh, Rock Angel. So... Paul, why is it called Rock Angel? Okay, so I'm going to give you a little, uh, a little sort of. I, again, this is all visual, but we can sort of see this. So, when you're in this Valley of Esclon, uh, and Whispering Angel is perhaps more from the valley floor, and the valley floor, the soils are a little bit more um, alluvial, perhaps with, with with clay and so forth. But as you go up the hill. Uh, not the mountain, but the hill, um, the soil starts to change. So if we were to go up um, the vineyards, let's say um, 100 meters or so, 100 meters would be like a football field or so, you go up and then the soil becomes very rocky. And if you were to dig a hole uh, at that middle sort of part of the hill, it, it has a lot more limestone and, and rock and gravel. And what is interesting is, so same grapes, right? You're working essentially with the Grenache and, and the roll is, 
Vines that grow in this rocky soil will produce a characteristic which we call minerality. So all of a sudden you're going from Whispering Angel, which is uh, perhaps more, more fruit forward to a different style. And the difference between the two is a hundred meters. So Rock Angel, rocky soil, hence the name. Okay. And, you know, Sasha is extremely witty. So uh, Whispering Angel, we could maybe credit for um, starting the Rosé Renaissance or the Rosé uh -huh. Revolution, uh, and certainly in the U.S. for sure, because I don't think there were a lot of people drinking Rosé back in 2006. But uh, now that he thinks, and, and Katie knows this because she she's this whole millennial generation that grew up with Whispering Angel, is what he said is, but that was 15 years ago or 16 years yeah. ago. So, so now we've all sort of grown up. Uh, obviously, I'm not a millennial, but it was like, it all started with a whisper but now it's time to rock i love it I, and I, I like the label too it almost looks like I'm with millennials i'm so happy i'm the last yeah. year of them <laughs> it makes me thrilled <laughs> i know sometimes I, I get put on the couch too i'm like yeah no 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 i'm new oh. you know not, but yes you are um but yes we started with a whisper of time to rock i love that and bertrand uh, we mentioned the sepage is similar grenache and so and roll yes Yes, but um, when you uh, improve in the range, uh, for, for uh, Archangel, for example, you have more Grenache and more Roll than in Whispering Angel. Ah. And less Senso or Shiraz. Okay, so you're putting in the more Grenache and the more Roll. Yes. Okay, which are those key elements. And the process of winemaking in Rock Angel, we talked about Whispering Angel being stainless steel. Mm. What about Rock Angel? Do you change anything? Yes, rock angel is not exactly the, the same process because uh, a part of the of the grapes, uh, roughly thirty percent in average, because it, it can change for every vintage. So thirty percent of the wine is um, uh, is vinified and aged aged in in big barrels. Like Paul said, it was a demi muy, big barrels of six hundred liters. So it's different to Bordeaux. Okay. Because in Bordeaux, it's small barrels. Uh, Are so they new, the, new barrels starts, or old old oak or new oak? Or uh, for, for Rock Angel, we have we have new barrels, but just uh, it's twenty percent maximum. And uh, and after we 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 have uh, another part, so in average seventy percent with a, a classic uh, vinification in stainless steel vats. And after, at the end of the fermentation and the, the aging, we blend the two parts. And but the, the, the specification of Rock Angel is uh, it's like a super whispering angel. You have more you have more density than in in, uh, in whispering angel because the wine um, vinified in in demi muy gives more density. Because you have the, the tannins of the wood, um, the, the tannins come in the wine, and you have more density, more length, and, and in the same time, it's it's also more aromatic. Yeah. Yes. But but yep. it's a classic. It's a classic rosé. Definitely smell more. It's it's mm -hmm. sort of it's sort of pops. It's funny because when I close my eyes, it's like you know you're in Provence. This sort of classic sort of spice and. Um, licorice and, and and those sort of things, which is uh, it's it's just interesting. And I, and I love the minerality because when I uh, describe sort of Rock Angel versus Whispering, which is sort of this, the Rock Angel has a little bit more sharpness. So I describe it like this: it sort of goes back, has a little bit more length, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's definitely a definitely a, a, a super Whispering Angel. Yeah, I, I like that. But I, yeah, what I notice also with these, and, and like you said, it goes like this because of the minerality, yeah. but I also get all that texture that's yeah. coming from possibly more roll. I don't know. I need to be talking, is it the magic ingredient of rolls, <laughs> the fermentino, because I just, I know that grape is so wonderfully texturous. I think that's the right word. But um, I just, I love the weight probably from a little bit of that oak and a little bit of that um, more of that, that grape. But yet, because of the minerality, it's still that linear thing. Yeah, sort of, sort of race, racy clean. And Bertrand, also, well, how would you describe the role in general? That what is the? It gives you what more weight, more. I guess more a little more weight, more. Um, 
I guess what, what I'm drinking Verbatim, a richness to it. So it's definitely, it's much, definitely ar aromatic. More aromatics, definitely more, more aromatics. Yes, um, a little bit more roll to it. Yeah, but it, so. it, it depends with the maturity, the, the, the yeah. personality of the role uh, uh, can change with the maturity. If you have a, a maturity, um, uh, a perfect maturity, you have more body in the wine. Uh, but, but the aromas are very different. And so for, for example, at, at Chateau d'Esclamp for Rock, um, we harvest some plots at the beginning of the harvest to have more aromas and some plots of roll we harvest at the end of the har harvest to have more complexity, more body, but less aromas. Okay. Oh, so it's just so delicious. And Katie, what do you have next up on pairing with this wine? Well, Paul said he closes his eyes and feels like he's in Provence. For me, on this freezing cold night, I'm here on Long Island, the wind is whipping outside. I can hear it coming through the chimney. For me, when I close my eyes and taste this wine, i am got my feet in the sand. I feel the warm breeze. I'm in St. Bart's. And I'm getting ready to have lunch and have some lobster because this is such a perfect, perfect wine for shellfish. And I, I think it, it's just such a good pairing. You, you taste this wine and it has like a creaminess to it. It's got the delicate fruit. It's still crisp and bright. And I think it goes so well with a shellfish. So I did a little crab toast for this and I've got some jumbo lump crab meat here. And I added a little Fresno chili to it to have a little kick of spice to it. There's basil, um, parsley, lemon zest. I did a little aioli of uh, mayonnaise, lemon, garlic. So very simple. And I made this earlier today to let the flavors kind of marry together and kept it in the fridge. Did some baguette toasted up here. And my husband's very excited because he gets to have all this for dinner tonight. <laughs> and the wine too. For dinner. <laughs> you got three bottles of wine, three orders. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a perfect little cocktail party hors d'oeuvre, or you can do this as a salad. If you're having people for lunch, make a little green salad and put a scoop of this on top, have it on a little toast. And it really does Mary so nicely with this rock angel. I love this wine so much. Can I just say that I love this wine? And I think that this would go really nicely with your Thanksgiving turkey. What yeah. do you think? Absolutely. Yep. yep. But again, like what you're saying, then go into the spring and summer when you're able to marry these beautiful, you know, when you're outside in the fan and warmth. Um, but I love that you have the, the shellfish, but with like a creamy texture, like a creaminess to it that I think will go. So well, perfectly yeah. together. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, at the beach. Sorry, guys. <laughs> You've transported me with this wine. So you are at the beach, just a very cold one. <laughs> um, well, it's a beautiful wine. So, and that looks delicious. I'm getting very hungry. But um, so our last wine that we're going to is Chateau de Slan Garus. So this is one of my personal favorites just because it's got a big G. And so as a Gwendolyn, every time I see a G on anything, I'm just really naturally drawn to it. So love that. Okay. Um, especially when it's luxury item. Yes. Um, so Garus, um, Paul, tell us a little bit about the idea and mission. I mean, we, we covered this a little bit in talking about Sasha coming to Provence, but tell us a little bit about that, that idea and mission behind Garus. What was he hoping to achieve? So I think I think Garus is the, is the ultimate um, expression, and what um, what Sasha Lachine was trying to do, and and obviously Patrick and and now Bertrand with with, um, with the winemaking. So how do you really? I guess what do we say this in English? Push the envelope. How could you really make something grand and something that never existed before? Uh, and it really had a lot to do with. Um, these the special part of the vineyard, uh, these vines, uh, now we're really focusing on Grenache and Roll, but much, much older. So the, the vines are getting close to 90 and 100 years old. And using this idea of barrel fermentation, which really did not exist in Provence, sort of more of a Burgundian uh, technique, um, taking this uh, slightly pink juice, 
fermenting in, in uh, these French oak barrels, which are quite large, six, what we call a demi mouille. So they're 600 liters versus 225. Uh, and then this whole, uh, you see these coils and this whole idea of, of uh, creating sort of an artificial winter and, and like in Burgundy and, and, and it's very, very technical. And even, I'm not even sure Patrick, Bertrand can tell me, I'm, uh, uh, but I'm not sure even Patrick and Sasha knew what the, the result would have been the first time they started doing this. It's so experimental. And, and at the end of the day is what happened was it took Rosé into a totally different category with um, the richness and the mouthfeel and the depth and also the ageability because most rosés um, mm. really don't age that quite well after six months or a year they sort of start to turn brown and I think that is the the idea of Garus it's sort of the um, the luxury of um, what rosé could be uh, and how how to have done it and and how to achieve it and and uh, this is this is for me. It gets me still excited to, to be honest. We'll talk about flavor profiles. I won't I won't yeah, let yeah. the cat out of the bag. But uh, I have my own idea of what it tastes like. Got it. And um, Bertrand, just tell us in, in kind of your words of how this wine is unique. You know, the, we talk, uh, Paul mentioned the age of the vines. Is that Grenache and Roll? What is the cépage here? Um, tell us a little bit about that. But for, for Garus, uh, one hundred. Percent of the wine is uh, is vinified and aged in in big barrels. Mm -hmm. With a part of new barrels, it, it could change for every vintage. But in average, it's 40 40 percent of new barrels. Wow! And, uh, and after one point very important, as you could see on the on the photos, uh, we are we are able to to control the temperature during the fermentation. And it's, it's a point very, very important to keep uh, the freshness and uh, the, aroma, the, the, the aromas. And uh, we were the first to, we were the, the first to, to create this technology, to, to be able to, uh, to, to, to go the wine in the barrels. And is, is Garus only Grenache and Roll? Yes, we are only Grenache and Roll. Grenache and Roll, no sense of Okay, yes. and what is the age of some of those vines? Uh, after, in, in the bottle after? No, the vineyards, the vines. The, the, ah, the vines, the yes. We, we, some plots are very, very old. We have, a, we have plots of Grenache and they, they are uh, 80 years old. Okay, yeah, you showed the vine now. That's kind of old. Um, and yes. you said vinified in oak, and then do you age it in oak after that? Or does it go straight to bottle? Yes. It, we, 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 no, we, the, the, the um, Garus is aging in, in barrels for uh, between uh, 11 and 12 months. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's sure. very unusual for a rosé. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a good point. So, so Whispering Angel will, will be, you know, blending and we'll start bottling just Christmas into the new year. Rock Angel, uh, because of the, you know, 25, 30% barrel of aging, we bottle around Easter time in the spring. And Garus is bottled just before the following harvest uh, in the summer. So that also is, is extremely uh, innovative to, to age rosé for almost a year in oak barrels before bottling. That's right. And you, Paul, were mentioning Burgundy, and you had mentioned earlier, so I did it, um, that you enjoy having a Garus in a Burgundy I, glass. I'm a, you know, it's my first, I started my, my first one. Uh, I started in Burgundy as, as a young man. I have this fondness for Burgundy. And sometimes um, I really, I love Garus in a Burgundy glass. If you spin your glass, don't spin it too much, otherwise I'll get it all over the computer. But uh, it has the, um, these beautiful sort of legs and tears uh, mm -hmm. In France, the, the men call them the legs, the women call them. She has this really viscous, and yeah. that is fantastic. So uh, this open glass, the aromas, it becomes extremely expressive. And then you start to, I mean, you close your eyes, really. It, you could be either in Burgundy, somewhere between, you know, Merceau and chassin Montpachet, or, or, or maybe a vintage Champagne. So, so but no, we're in Provence. So, so th mm -hmm. think about how far this has come from you know the 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 rosé by the swimming pool with with pink flamingos and unicorns this is this is I mean, very serious and and i think that's that's what gets gets us all so excited 
Mm. Okay, I'm tasting before I'm supposed to, but um, yeah, tell us a little bit about you know what that burgundy glass does. What does it help bring out for you? So uh, as, as I'm spinning, so obviously um, a sort of a Bordeaux glass is a little more closed. Mm -hmm. It's bigger, so more aeration. The aromas sort of sort of jump out of it, and then you start to get this this um, the ginger and the um, exotic sort of characteristics, and uh, we call it sort of the marzipan and, and all that all those things that you would never never associate with rosé. It's just extremely complex, um, but also rich on the palate, and I think that is it's it's um, for I, I will say this is is for um, perhaps a red wine drinker uh, which m most of us are is is I think you would be just as satisfied with the, the mouthfeel of Garus as, as a red wine and if you, again not closing my eyes but if I were to drink this in a black glass I was about I'm to not, say this is a great <laughs> wine to put in a black glass you might not guess it's yeah. a rosé. I feel like I'd be in Burgundy, easy. You'd be, you might be somewhere. I'm not sure, but it's, it's just very oh. interesting. Oh. And so you mentioned aging. Well, tell us about what you're getting right now too on the texture and the palette of, because you were spinning, but. Um, so this idea of more, and if you think about a red wine is, Red, usually the red wines become darker, fuller, richer, right? More, more, more. This is actually quite opposite because the color is lighter than the first two that we had. It's almost transparent. Do not be deceived because the flavor and the richness is much, much, much more. But the, the secret of this wine is despite the richness and the fullness in the body, no astringency, no bitterness, no bite. And I think that is again the the and I'll say I'll raise my glass. So bravo, bravo to, to Bertrand and and, Bertrand. and Patrick because to be able to create this style of wine, which which has the richness, has the fullness, and has the body without the astringency and the bitterness and the bite. And I think that is the that is sort of the magic of what happens at, at Chateau Desclon and uh, why it's so so drinkable. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you know, someone who is tuning, we get some questions ahead of time, and one of them was asking if we were going from you know, light to heavy or, um, you know, that sort of dry to sweet. And it's kind of, you know, thinking of kind of, like, oh, it's a progression, yes, but it doesn't have to necessarily do with light to heavy or because it just has to do with that style and complexity. And it's more of a progression, right? Fuller, fuller richer. Yeah, fuller, and richer. More. And yeah. And I think there's this also, but they remain, as we say in French, it's uh, uh, tendu, which is, which is tense. So mm -hmm. the tenseness in the wine keeps it, keeps it drinkable and then also extremely food friendly because then you can really start to do more interest. I mean, more. And, and again, I'm not criticizing red wine, but if you chose not to drink red wine, um, I think Garus is the ultimate solution. Mm. Yeah. Um, so... Katie, um, well, actually, actually, first, Paul, I, I wanted to ask you and, and Bertrand if you have something, some ideas on this too. How does this evolve in the cellar? We mentioned the age worthiness or ageability of this, which is rare for some rosé. We think, oh, I only drink rosé in the summer and then I'm done and off I go. This is not the case. This can be drunk any season. This can be um, kept for a while. How do we navigate that? I'll let Bertrand answer because he, he has a much better cellar than I do. And I'm guessing he has pretty much every vintage of Garus going back for a long time. <laughs> yes, yes. This one is able to wait for, for a long time. In my cellar, um, yes, I have many vintages of, of Garus. And like, uh, like how many, like six, seven, eight? <laughs> yes. And uh, one month ago, I, I tasted uh, the vintage 2008. Mm. Eight. Yes, two, two, eight, 2008. And uh, so it's, it's very different. And it, when the wine um, age more, you, you more, it, it looks like a, a Burgundy wine or a Condrieux <laughs> also. You have, uh, it's very rich. You have just a touch of oxidation, uh, but it, it's perfect. Ah. perfect. Especially, it keeps very well in a magnum or a double magnum. Mm -hmm. as, yeah. as evidence behind you. Yes, yes. So I haven't, I haven't drunk that yet. So Bertrand has a better cellar, but I have a big, bigger bottles. 
I, I don't even know how to respond to that. So, um, <laughs> Katie, let's move on to the food. Um, I think you're pairing something with this magnificent wine that might include bacon. Yay. It does. I mean, well, what, uh, what's not uh, a happier food than bacon, right? <laughs> um, when I first had this wine and I was thinking about pairing, um, I went to pork. I, I think that this would be so good if I'm, if I'm thinking about a holiday table with a crown roast to pork. So to do like a nice spice rub on it, um, maybe some sort of uh, cornbread and dried fruit stuffing in the center of the crown roast of pork. And I just think this would be so delicious with it. Um, the way that it has this kind of um, spice to it and it's still light and acidic. I think it would go really, really nicely. But bacon with that smoky flavor, I think it's gonna be delicious with this wine. So I've got in the oven coming out. I realized that I'm kind of making our Christmas Eve hors d'oeuvres here. We always have that crab toast and we always have these water chestnuts wrapped in bacon. I know I read your little intros on your cookbook and I was like, this is our Christmas Eve. This is our, this I was like, well, yes, we're ready for holiday. Yes, we are ready for holiday in this family. We're, we're always ready for Christmas. My husband is Mr. Christmas and this is actually his recipe. He makes this every Christmas Eve. So it's a very vintage recipe. It's water chestnuts and then you wrap them in bacon with a toothpick and then you make a mixture of ketchup brown sugar and sambal and worcestershire sauce and then you paint that on them and bake them and they get nice and glazed the sugar all comes out and they get crispy and i like having that little bit of spice i think it goes really nicely with the wine again like with the crab toast having the little bit of fresno chili in there i think it just really works and I like the sweet and the smoky bacon, the saltiness, and then you get the crunch of the water chestnut. I think it just all works really well together. And there you have it. That's beautiful. It's so if cool. you talk to me later on, I'm just gonna be hiding with this platter and the rest of the fruit. <laughs> I'm like, can I come over? Cause I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard tomorrow at 6 a.m. when my daughter starts crying and is ready to wake up. And there's oh, my- the There we go. <laughs> Coming in for a Not bite. Bacon. <laughs> Did they say bacon? What? Huh? Yeah. Um, I think that's a beautiful match. I mean, there's so many complex flavors in that um, that I never actually would have necessarily put together, but I love all of them. And I think that for such a complex wine- you know, in a way you've got some simple things going there, but that they become complex all together and you have that. Yeah. Okay. And all of these recipes are really simple. It's like my books, it's not complicated. None of these are complicated and these are not complicated pairings. These are really easy to do. And these wines are so drinkable <laughs> and delicious. And I, I just think that they have such a range of what you can pair them with. And again, I think this Garus, if, if you're having a luxurious Thanksgiving, this would be the one to drink. Yeah. And, and almost like I, I would serve this at a many a dinner party actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is uh, beautiful. So, um, well, I think we've gotten to see this progression of wines through Chateau Desclan. And, um, as I mentioned, I've been there and you're, you're open to receive people. Yes. To come yes, visit. We are. Okay. And, and we would love to, uh, when you are um, now that hopefully with things that we're traveling again, and, and we would love to welcome you the next time you're in the south of France, what we call the Côte d'Azur, if you happen to be in Monaco, Nice, Cannes, Saint-Tropez, please come say hello, uh, and we will take very good care of you, and we'll take you to the chapel, and uh, take you to the magical land of Rosé. Yes. Yeah. And um, like I said, I've been there. Been too long though, so perhaps I'll be one of those people hopping, hopping over next summer. That might um, be my first trips. <laughs> all right, that's gonna be one of your first trips. That might be one of my first trips. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're mentioning having the six a.m. daughter. The last time I was there, unfortunately, I was I was not unfortunate. It was still beautiful, but I was pregnant. So I'm like, can I go back next time? Not. That. <laughs> do a do over. And, and I'll, I'll add in is is obviously everyone a lot of um, a lot of people come to visit in the summer because it's it's a summer destination. But uh, if you come in September, we're obviously we're, we're that's when we pick our grapes and it's our harvest. So uh, bring your boots and we'll put you to work and yeah. uh, you come for harvest. 
Yeah. Oh, my husband's looking at me. He's waving, saying, yeah, we'll be there. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So it's a road trip and it's more of a plane flight. But, uh, right. Um, well, thank you so much to everyone. Um, just wonderful ideas for entertaining. And again, um, Katie, your cookbook is It's Not Complicated, which, like I said, it speaks to me. I'm sure it speaks to many people. Um, and um, wonderful recipes, beautiful wines. I love tasting these all side by side. I've had them all, but I haven't tasted them together. And I think it really shows Bertrand what you're doing, um, you know, where the wines are coming from in the vineyard, how you're working with them in the cellar. And, and that really is reflected here as we've tasted. So um, thank you. And, and for everyone watching, thank you so much for joining us. And if you didn't get a chance to taste the wines, they are still available on wine.com, either as a set or individually. Um, again, um, Katie mentioned, all mentioned, these are great for um, holiday gatherings, as well as any family gatherings um, that you might have coming up in the next years. Uh, which we all will. So, you know, anything for that rosé all day. And and Katie, you had mentioned that there's now a country song called rosé all day. I, just, I had to throw that out there. I heard it on the radio and I was like cracking up the whole time. It was really funny. Okay. So look at that. Anyway. Um, it's a thank you. Song's just about beer drinking now. Rose. Yeah, it's rosé all day. I mean, it's come so far, right? We have. Um, as, long, as long as you say, s'il vous plaît. Bien sûr. Bien Paul. Yes. Um, but thank you all so much again, Bertrand, for especially you for staying up late um, in Provence and um, appreciate you and Paul and Katie, uh, your time, your expertise. Very welcome. Merci, santé, chin chin. Come see us soon as we say in French, à bientôt. Okay. Okay, cheers. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice, and now our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.